thanks so much to uh, Kelly and Ginger for organizing this and for having us from the University of Arizona be here to participate in this uh, in this forum. Um, uh, I've really enjoyed my time on the Scientific Advisory Board for FSR, and that is an organization, that foundation has really had a high impact, I think, across the country, and it's been really great to, to work with those folks. Um, my uh, background, I'm a pulmonary critical care physician, like Dr. Knox. I'm a physician scientist, and so we do a lot of research that's focused on um, the lung, of course. and. Uh, I published a bunch of papers, but I wanted to tell you the very first paper I ever published was on sarcoidosis, where we uh, examined the immune um, cells that were in the lung. Back a long time ago, I'm not going to say the date because it will age me, but um, it was quite a long time ago. But it's really um, what I wanted to do today is talk a little bit about where the field has been going and kind of what I think is um, a horizon that is um, going to be with us very, very soon. And I think many of you know about the, uh, you've heard about precision medicine, precision health, personalized medicine. So we're going to talk a little bit about how, that, what that means for, for folks with sarcoidosis. Now it's just, whoa. I just, just didn't do that when I just went through this uh, earlier. This could be a problem. Can you probably see what you're Yeah. Let's just, right. So, I know. Maybe you can just look at it too Maybe people here just use my iPad. Sorry, give us just a minute to see if we can get it get it so you guys can see it a little better. That would be a lot better. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so what is personalized medicine or this precision health? You read about it in the paper, it's, it's all around us. Well, to some folks, like our former U.S. Health and Human Services Secretary, Tony Thompson, it's the right medicine, the right person, the right dosage at the right time. Other organizations have a, sort of a little bit different slant on things, but however you you view this, it's really using molecular analyses to optimize therapies and, and treatments for that individual. So when I was a, when I was chief of pulmonary at the Johns Hopkins, I moved to the University of Chicago as a, as a chair of medicine there. And the first week I showed up in Chicago, this was the headline for the Chicago trip, genes, your body's crystal ball. Well, I've been really deeply involved in, in how to apply the new information that was derived from the mapping of the human genome. And uh, it's very clear that genes are our body's crystal ball. We use this to make diagnostic decisions. Um, we think it's got something to do with your genome. And we use it to make uh, therapeutic decisions, like bring me a stem cell when it's appropriate, right? But we have uh, mapped out the human genome early, in the early 2000s, and that was a daunting task. I would say it's probably the most impactful biological discovery ever. And we found out that there's three billion base pairs, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but besides mapping out that sequence of the human genome, what came along with, the, with that uh, project was the development of some tools that have really radically changed the, um, the clinical and clinical research environment. And with that came these technologies that allow us to very rapidly sequence the genome. All of a sudden it went from taking years to do it to taking hours. We were able to now look at the genes that are in the genome, and they used to do one gene at a time to see whether that gene expression was up or down. We can do all of the genes in the genome with one experiment, we'll talk about that. We can look at proteins, how proteins are altered. We can look at how patients uh, and their responses to, to everything through massive uh, 
uh, data sets that are generated using these technologies. So you use these technologies, you generate a lot of data, and if you integrate that data, you can really come up with some very interesting and insightful uh, results. So this is showing you how if you integrate a lot of data involved with autoimmune disease, like lupus we heard earlier, if you do that, you can create a pathway that seems to be important on what's driving that disease. Now, <clears throat> these data sets um, are massive. This looks pretty complicated, I know. But what do you think about this? <laughs> that looks pretty complicated. But you know what this is? This is actually the reporting structure for the Federal Emergency Management Agency. So I would say that if you can understand this, <laughs> the human genome is going to be a piece of cake. <laughs> He's the president of the so, so I thought I'd just kind of put together some of the challenges that we have um, that we're really uh, leveraging the talks, the wonderful talks you just heard. So what are some of the challenges? Well, one of them is the fact that, um, and I think Dr. Knox uh, highlighted this, is the fact that most folks with sarcoid spontaneously remit or with a short, very brief course of steroids get better. Now, the problem is, is that a large percentage of patients, and you heard all three of our uh, presenters talk about this, some go on to progressive lung sarcoid, some develop neurosarcoid, we just heard, some develop cardiac sarcoid. So these complicated sarcoidosis is a problem and a vexing problem. We also know that <coughs> certain populations are more predisposed for the complicated sarcoid and development of sarcoid. Folks of color in this country, uh, Latinos and, and African Americans, have um, higher uh, prevalence of sarcoid. And when they have sarcoid, it's uh, more severe, suggesting obviously a genetic basis for the disease. And again, it's been pointed out by all three speakers, um, biomarkers to detect baseline sarcoid and the complications of sarcoid are not very useful. The diagnostic tools are sort of uh, challenging Doing biopsies of the brain, biopsies of the heart, as been noted, is difficult, and repetitive biopsies of the lung uh, like that as well. And then finally, as you've also heard, um, steroids. You heard from Abani earlier, steroids are not exactly um, without its complications. And then you go on to the second and third line drugs, and those have not only the, uh, the complications of immunosuppression, but they also have the complications of uh, potentially increased infection. So if we look at how we're going to do precision medicine in patients with sarcoid, I would say we have to address a couple of questions. One of them is, how can we diagnose sarcoid with less invasive technologies? How can we identify folks that are susceptible to develop sarcoid? Friends and families want to know who in some of those families might be susceptible for sarcoid. And importantly, once you have sarcoid, and this is the dilemma that a practicing pulmonologist with a newly diagnosed sarcoid patient has, is this a patient that's going to be spontaneously remitting, or with a whiff of steroids for a short period of time get better, or is this someone that has the risk of developing the complications of sarcoid that we've heard about today? And then finally, once you've decided on a patient that needs um, more than a whiff of start the steroids, how do we optimize those therapies that uh, Ken uh, mentioned earlier um, in order to treat that particular um, type of sarcoid? So these are the institutions I've been at since before I came to the University of Arizona. As I, uh, most of the work that I do clinically is actually in the ICU. But I'm very um, interested and in, my lab's been interested for quite some time in the diseases shown here. And the way we think about this is that our goal was always to identify new biomarkers, markers in the blood that can help us understand the disease, find new targets that are potential targets for therapies, find the risk factors for why people develop the disease and why what risk factors and genetic variants might be driving the severity of the disease, and then of course try to come up with new approaches to the therapy. So sarcoid, we, we spend a, a considerable time with, with uh, folks with sarcoid. And um, we really try to answer some of these questions. How can we diagnose sarcoid non-invasively, the susceptible patients, and identify patients with complicated sarcoid? So <clears throat> the way we've done it is two approaches. One is a genomic approach, and I'll talk about the genetic approach in a second. So what are we talking about the genomic approaches? Well, like I mentioned before, there's 20-some thousand genes, 
And before the Human Genome Project used to like, you know, pick a gene, study it, hope you were studying the right gene. But now, because of technologies like this, this is called a microarray. So a microarray took a page out of the computer chip uh, industry, and they were able to print millions of these little probes on this very, very small surface. And then when you get the patient's blood or a piece of tissue, isolate their um, RNA from that, you can now, instead of just looking at one gene, you can look at all of the genes in, in one experiment. Revolutionary, really. And the other approach is sort of the same way, printing on a very small uh, surface, a lot of probes that allow you to look for variations in the genome across the entire genome. So these are the two approaches that I think have been very revolutionary. We, we and others have been using these for quite some time. And the way we've done this in patients um, is to obtain the corporate <coughs> blood. So what's good about that is that you don't need a biopsy of the lung or the heart or the brain, but you take peripheral blood and isolate cells from the blood. And then we use these small chips I just talked to you about. We do the, the assessment of the gene expression, and it gives you a heat map that looks like that. We'll talk about that in a little bit. And then um, through um, an informatics approach of just analyzing that, that information, it can give you a signature in the patients that you're studying. So we've done this in, in these diseases, sarcoid, pulmonary fibrosis, sickle cell, et cetera. And I'm going to share with you a little bit that we showed in sarcoidosis. So <clears throat> when we did this, we did a, a study a, a number of years ago where we took blood from patients in our clinics, isolated their blood cells from the blood, and we did the experiment I just showed you. Took the RNA from there, hybridized it to those chips, when we did that, we looked for expression of genes. So we looked at all of the genes, 20,000 genes. Which genes are going up in expression? Which genes are going down? And let's see whether we can tell the difference between patients with sarcoid and patients that are healthy controls. And when we did that, what we found... Oh, that was supposed to be my cue to tell you that Dr. Knox and I were working together on this project back then. Uh, and so when we did that, we found um, a very, very striking differences between healthy controls and patients with sarcoid. Now, this is a heat map, and when you look at across the line, every line, every row is a different gene, and every column is a different patient. And it's really um, important that I tell you that blue means the gene is uh, very low expressed, meaning that it's not very active, and red means there's a lot of expression of that gene. And I think it's pretty easy to see that patients with sarcoid um, in the uh, first cluster um, have different gene expression than patients with, uh, that are healthy controls in the second cluster. And so here's a blood test. So the, the reason this is cool is that this is a blood test. Now, if you if you're, um, have it, as Ken mentioned, this is a diagnosis of occlusion. Maybe if you have a blood test that has the right chest X-ray, the CT scan, and you have a signature for sarcoidosis here, maybe you don't need the lung biopsy in that case. Now, importantly, and the reason that we were really doing this wasn't really tell so much healthy controls from, um, from sarcoid patients, was really try to get at this question. Because as a practicing doc, again, this is the vexing problem. Who needs really close monitoring? Who needs aggressive therapy early for their sarcoid versus patients that are going to spontaneously remit? So from those genes that we were just telling, talking about, we looked at genes that helped us distinguish the expression patterns between patients that had uncomplicated sarcoid, meaning they had sarcoid, but they're very stable. Maybe they come off steroids, or maybe they unload those steroids. Very stable um, clinical course versus patients that have cardiac sarcoid, patients that have neurosarcoid, and patients that have progressive lung disease, meaning their lung function is declining. And when we did that, we came up with this 20-gene signature that helps sort out patients with uncomplicated sarcoid and patients with complicated sarcoid. So <clears throat> this was, um, we, we published this a, a few years ago. We're refining this signature now. We're testing it in a greater number of populations. Our goal here, of course, is to be able to do this at the point of care. So because it's only 20 genes, this is a test now that we can do in the clinic. Come to clinic. We do this test and see you on the first time that we see you in clinic and diagnose your sarcoid, we can say, well, wow, you're in a group that we may have to really pay attention to and follow you a little differently than, than 
that we might otherwise, because you have a, a signature that you might be developing or already have complicated sarcoidosis. And when you look at the 20 genes, and it's not critical that we go through them, but what you can see here, if you look at the three bars and every um, for every gene here, you can see in general um, the first bar is healthy controls, second bar is uncomplicated sarcoid, and the third bar is complicated. And you can see in most cases the gene expression is going down, um, with the exception of, of this one. Uh, and this is um, important because now here's a here's a gene that's being exp whose expression is increasing as you develop more complicated sarcoid. But as it turns out, this is a growth factor that is uh, shows up in the blood. So right now we're trying to assess whether the detection of this growth factor in fact might also correlate with increasing complicated sarcoid. So that's a, that's, now we might have a new biomarker out of this because of this exploration of the genes that I've just shared with you. And <clears throat> we've taken this uh, further. Um, this is a work that's done with Dr. Casablanca, who's sitting at the front here with Dr. Knox and myself. And we've taken this gene expression uh, uh, strategy, and now we've identified a signaling pathway that we think is really, really quite important. It's called the JAK-STAT signaling pathway. And this is a, a pathway by which cells get activated. And the reason that's important is that <clears throat> this, uh, and this is just telling you that when we looked at the types of genes that were different between complicated and uncomplicated, the JAK-STAT signaling pathway was very, very uh, prevalent. And, it, um, and it's also helped distinguish complicated from uncomplicated sarcoidosis. And the ramifications of that, I think the implications of that, is that here's another biomarker that we can use in clinic at point of care testing. But more importantly, this is a pathway that's drugable. There are inhibitors now used in the cancer literature that are, can block this pathway. And we are right now very much hot, hot on, the, on the tail of trying to identify which of those inhibitors might be best to do a clinical trial in patients with complicated sarcoid. So <clears throat> what, about, uh, what about the genetic approaches? Well, again, the Human Genome Project, they keep talking about it. You, you guys know what it is. It's uh, it, the big uh, enlightenment from that was we found out that our DNA is made of about three billion base pairs. And if you look at everyone on the planet, 99.9% .9 of all of those base pairs are exactly the same. So you don't have to be a math major to know that leaves you with about 0.1% that makes us have differences between each of us. And these differences come in these things called polymorphisms, as SNPs, insertions, deletions. What does that mean? So here's two people. There's a sequence. Person one, person two. And here's a little stretch of their three billion base pairs, but you look here, person one's missing three of those base pairs, right? So that's a deletion. And if you look over here, person one has a A, where most people would have a T, that's a single nucleotide polymorphism, a genetic variant. And if you look at that 0.1% variation, you know, basically we're all the same on 99.9, .9, but 0.1% variation actually makes us different from who we are. So what are we looking for? We're looking for those variations in the genome that cause disease, right? That is it's truly the holy grail for the genetic epidemiology of a complex disease like sarcoidosis. So we want to find what variants are, are present in patients with sarcoidosis, and we have to scour the 23 pairs of chromosomes in order to find that. But does that sound easier or does it sound hard? Well. <coughs> Folks thought that when we could sequence the genome, it would be very easy. Turns out it's very hard. Um, you know, finding that one variation, let's say it's like cystic fibrosis, finding the one polymorphism in cystic fibrosis that causes cause CF was really challenging. And it's like finding a misspelled word in an encyclopedia set, right? Mm -hmm. So let's say you've, you're able to hone it down to a single chromosome. Well, that's good. Now you're, you're closer on the track, but within that chromosome, that volume has a lot of pages. So you have to find the right page in that whole volume. And then once you find the right page, you have to actually find the, the misspelled word on that page. And that is really tough. And so it's like finding this misspelled word in a sentence, in a paragraph, on a page, in a volume, in an entire, entire encyclopedia set. So 
Fortunately, the tools for finding that polymorphism or that variant are now really, really affordable. So this is a, just a, a quick graph of the cost of sequencing the, the human genome. And you can see that when they started back in 2001, oh my God, the, the cost of sequencing the genome was outrageous, more than 10 million. And over the time, with the increasing, uh, the increasing rapidity of the technology, the high power throughput uh, um, technology, you can see that now it's about a thousand dollars and a little bit less in some places to, to do a whole genome sequencing. So as a result, you know, it's, we're very, very close to this cartoon where you just drop off your sequence here and then whole genome sequencing is going to be part of your medical record. That's the whole point behind President Obama's uh, a precision medicine initiative, of which we're one of the four clinical centers in the United States doing the precision medicine initiative. The whole point is to find the sequences of individuals and link them up to drugs and diseases and try to find out how they influence the outcome for patients. So we've, uh, we've, we're interested in finding those variations in, in fibrotic lung diseases, scarring diseases. One of them is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis. This is another disease like sarcoid that scars the lung. It's different than sarcoid because there's no granulomas in patients that have IPF. But you can see from this slide that um, the x-rays look similar in patients that have um, uh, ongoing IPF. And you can also see that it's a very um, dismal disease because the median survival of three years um, is a problem. If you don't get transplanted and you have a declining uh, course with your IPF, that, that is a really uh, big issue. There's no biomarkers, and, and unlike sarcoid, the, uh, the therapies are, are not so effective. And the other thing is that, like sarcoid, that has some people that are very stable and, get, and spontaneously improve, some folks with IPF have, have a very stable course as well. So the idea here is that, you know, how do you tell the patients that have a stable IPF from those that are going to wind up needing transplantation. Well, we've used genetic and genomic approaches. We found signatures, just like I shared with you in Sarcoid. We published signatures that help identify those that might need transplantation. We've also found those genetic variants. <coughs> a couple papers, here's one in Lancet, here's one in JAMA. Find some variants and some genes that together we can start putting together a number of variants that when placed together, help identify patients with IPF that might be at risk for um, declining IPF and, and need for transplantation. We've done this in, uh, in sarcoidosis as well, just to help underscore the fact that sarcoid has a genetic basis for this disease. You can see here that the differences among populations. Um, uh, Jennifer mentioned the Japanese having a much higher incidence of cardiac sarcoid compared to other uh, racial groups. Again, that's true across um, multiple uh, races and ethnicities. <coughs> African Americans, Northern Europeans, in Scandinavia, for some reason, there's a very high prevalence of, of sarcoid. If you go to um, Ireland, Ireland's got a very, very high incidence of uh, prevalence of sarcoid there. And within populations, it, it varies a lot. There's been a number of studies that have looked at the genetic basis for sarcoid. We haven't gotten the, um, found the silver bullet the gene or the, the number of genes that are causative for sarcoid development or susceptibility, but we're getting closer. Papers like this from uh, Courtney Montgomery uh, highlighted some differences between um, African Americans and, and non-Hispanic Caucasians. And we've conducted studies just like that and we're <clears throat> where we um, analyzed across the genome variations in patients that are African American and non Hispanic uh, Caucasians, complicated versus uncomplicated. And we have, um, in, in this population, we've identified actually some really interesting variations in the, those in specific genes. And one of the things that's important about that is that this analysis actually helped to validate the idea that looking at the JEX, that signaling pathway that I mentioned earlier, actually makes sense because. Patients with complicated sarcoid had more variations in the signaling pathway than patients with uncomplicated sarcoid. So we're, we're, we're about to, uh, ready to validate this in, in yet another cohort, and I think this is uh, adding more um, ammunition to the idea that this is a useful approach. So the last part I just want to spend a couple minutes on 
is uh, optimizing therapies. Um, clearly, uh, as we mentioned before, steroids have their issues and their other uh, uh, problems with the uh, with the other modalities used to treat sarcoidosis. Ken mentioned each of these. Um, the cytokine modulators, just to spend a moment on how to precision medicine might be affecting and, and enhancing our ability to fine-tune the utilization of these uh, therapies. Um, infliximab and adalimumab um, are two anti-TNF um, uh, inhibitors. TNF is a cytokine, I don't know if you we mentioned it earlier, but TNF is a, stands for tumor necrosis factor. It's produced by a lot of cells, primarily inflammatory cells, and it's a very, very potent inflammatory mediator. When it hits a cell, it binds a receptor, it causes a lot of inflammation, and it causes a lot of cell death as well. So using uh, strategies to either mop up TNF as it's in the circulation or block the receptor that it binds, our strategies are being used in many, many autoimmune diseases and rheumatologic diseases like rheumatoid arthritis, and, and et cetera. And uh, the, the reason for thinking about anti-TNF therapy in sarcoid, it makes sense. There's, if you look in patients that have sarcoid, there's a lot of TNF in the lung. There's a lot of TNF in the bloodstream. The higher amounts of TNF in your bloodstream, the more likely you are to have progressive sarcoidosis and, and some of the complications of sarcoidosis, and it's associated with a poor um, prognosis. Part of that's related to the fact that it makes you more resistant to the steroid uses that, that you're on if your TNF levels are higher. And we and, and others have conducted studies looking at anti-TNF therapy in patients with um, chronic and, and refractory sarcoidosis. This is infliximab. We did a study in um, looking at refractory sarcoidosis as well. And what we found is that, you know, these are small studies, relatively small studies, but it seems to have a, an effect on stabilizing the disease and in some patients improving the disease. And that's the, and we've used the rituximab as well for refractory pulmonary sarcoidosis. So the question is, which patients would benefit the most from an anti tna therapy? And that's where we're at right now. I think we, using these genomic approaches and genetic approaches I've just mentioned, I think we can, in the very near future, identify which patients are most likely to benefit from anti-TNF therapy. Mm -hmm. We can use serum levels of TNF as part of that. We can look at signatures of TNF-related genes and see what signatures identify patients most likely to respond to anti-TNF therapy. We can do genetic analysis because we know that there's variations that control how much TNF a, a cell or a body makes, so that would be another clue. As importantly as identifying who's to respond to them, you know, I think the, the strategy is to identify those folks that are likely to have adverse effects from an anti-TNF therapy. You mentioned earlier, and as mentioned by, by Holly, that the um, uh, anti-TNF therapy is associated with immunosuppression, you got complications of uh, infection, can be really, really uh, dramatic and it's associated with increased risk of cancer. Um, these, are, these are risks associated with these types of therapies, but again, these risks are amenable to uh, assessment using the approaches I'm just mentioning to you that can identify folks most likely to be adversely affected by these therapies um, and most likely to be responding to these therapies. So <clears throat> the last part I just want to mention is that we, uh, the the FSR is a very, very important source of funding for um, research in sarcoidosis. Um, the National uh, Institute of Health and Heart Lung, Lung Institute is as well. Um, they have created, uh, four years ago, they created a clinical network of um, sarcoidosis centers um, at the University of Arizona. Uh, myself, Ken, and uh, Nancy um, run the, uh, the Brad's uh, Center for the University of Arizona. And this is a, uh, a, a seven um, institution clinical network. We've recruited about 500 patients with sarcoid to this. We've, um, we're doing uh, genetic and genomic analysis of, um, of, of samples from those patients. And I think the information that will be shortly coming out from this very important work, we're four years into it, and, and now the data is starting to to come out, I think that that kind of information is the kind of information that I'm really speaking to you about today. How do we get information that allows us to 
sub um, stratify patients into categories where they're most likely to benefit from this therapy, most likely to be diagnosed with um, complicated sarcoidosis. And so at the end of the day, you know, when you want to do precision medicine, it's really a team sport. You need the clinicians, you need the genomicists, the geneticists, you need someone that can analyze these big data sets, people that can do the imaging, the trialists, but really you need the patients. You need you to be part of this team in order to help us understand what's working, what's not working. And I think um, the future is actually very bright in my opinion. I've been at this a long time. It seems that the tools are right in our hands now. They're met affordable, they're amenable, and I think the next few years are going to be very, very interesting for folks with SARCO. So let me stop there. Tell you thanks so much for your attention.